You are listening to the Religious Studies Project, bringing critical study of religion live to your ears right now, because you're listening. My name is Christopher Cotter. My name's David Robertson, and uh, it's good to be back. This is the second week back for from our summer break. We're hoping that your academic year is heating up. Um, if not, if you're not in a department at the moment, then we'll bring it to you. Exactly. Who have you got this week, Chris? This week, um, we've got uh, a little-known scholar called David Robertson, um, who's speaking to a very well-known scholar called Grace Davy, or Grace Davy, as I like to say in my indigenous accent. Your brogue. In my brogue. Um, Grace has been on the RSP before. She was one of the first interviews that I recorded back in Milwaukee in um, October 2011. I recorded that interview wow. on the changing nature of religion. And today, she's speaking to David but a broad introduction to the sociology of religion. Now, this is the first uh, interview in, a, in an ongoing series um, co-produced by Socrail, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But first, let me introduce Grace. What is the sociology of religion? For that matter, what is sociology? What are the particular concerns, the dominant themes and defining methodologies of the sociology of religion? Where did it begin and how has it evolved? Where is it going? This interview will hopefully address some of these questions at least. Today, I'm joined by Professor Emeritus Grace Davy from the University of Exeter. Her research focused on patterns of religion in Europe and how to conceptualise them. How are we to make sense of the growing significance in religion in the modern world? When our categories and terms and concepts have emerged largely from the exceptional European faith. Her books include Religion in Britain since 1945. Europe, the exceptional case, and her most recent book, Religion in Britain, A Persistent Paradox, which was published last year. First of all, welcome back to the Religious Studies Project, Grace. Thank you. Um, this episode is the first in a series co-produced Socrel, the Sociology of Religion Study Group of the British Sociological Association, celebrating their 40th anniversary. The series is entitled New Horizons in British Sociology of Religion. And in the weeks to come, we'll address some specific issues in the sociology of religion. But today, we'll be introducing the subject. So, it seems to me that the obvious place to start, then, is to ask, first, what is sociology? And then, what is the sociology of religion? I'll do my best. Sociology <laughs> is the study of society. Um, I think the best way to, to think about this is to consider society as a series of patterns. It's not simply random. What goes on in societies is not totally random. It forms patterns. And the task of the sociologist is to first discern those patterns, discover them, using all many, many different kinds of data to do that, and then really to think hard about them and try to explain them, try to explain why things are as they are. And the study of religion is part of that. It, 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 it's within society. Um, religions are located in places. They don't just exist. And beliefs are held by real people who have um, real concerns and cares in their lives. Um, it's not an abstract thing. It, it's very concrete. And when we come to the study of religion, we're going to think, um, why are things like that? Are there historical reasons for these? Are there... Um, social reasons, um, and then we're going to try and explain them. Let me give you an example which is very clear in, in our own society, that in Christian churches, and that's most churches in this country, not all, but most, and historically dominant religion, you will find almost invariably that more women are involved than men. Why is that so? Uh, uh, that's not so easy to explain. It, it's a very, very good discussion starter because everybody has an idea about that. But it's not so easy to explain. And, and that's really a very good starting point. I know you'll be talking about gender and feminism later in this series. So think of that example. If you push open the door of any church where a service is going on, you will almost always find more women than men. It's cheating if you go to a boys public school. But in, in the average um, congregation, and in statistics of belief and, 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 and is religion important in your life, this pattern will show and we need an explanation. And that's absolutely central to the sociology of religion. Um, and it also relates to why the patterns about gender in our society 
Um, and so the links between religion and other social forces are immediately apparent. Great. So we're, we're talking about people and patterns of groups of people um, in particular. Um, I was quite interested in the, um, the four roles of the sociology of religion that you outline in, in your book on the subject, which I think comes from Runciman. That's that correct. Right? That's correct. Well, I've, I, um, I've already done two of them for you, I think. In, in the, uh, um, the patterns are the, the, the rep- reportage. I mean, um, simply the facts and the figures, what exists, what can we find out from the widest possible um, range of data. Um, statistics, yes, but narrative as well. Um, different kinds of methodologies, observation, participant observation, um, interviews, softer interviews, all kinds of ways of discovering what is there. And then we have to explain it, explanation. But the third one, I think, um, of Runciman's four points is maybe the most interesting and the most challenging for students of sociology. That is to describe, and I don't mean describe in the way that we've just done that, um, finding the facts and figures. I mean describing what it's like for the people involved. And that's, for me, what brings sociology alive and the sociology of religion alive. For example... Um, can you put your sh- yourself in the shoes of um, a young Muslim woman who's recently arrived in this country? Um, she doesn't feel very well, and she knows that it would be a good thing to get a medical opinion, but um, the only doctor available in her locality is a man, and so it would be rather difficult for her to to be examined by that um medical professional, whether good or sensitive he was. And so she's in a dilemma. Now, can you, the sociologist, appreciate that? Can you put yourself in the shoes of that individual? Or quite differently, can you put yourself in the shoes of a white person in our society who feels threatened by migration, who, as it were, constructs this as a swarm or a flood or something uncontrollable? Um, and start saying really very unpleasant things about migration and the religions of people who are coming into our country. Can you understand what that person is thinking? Have you the imagination to do that? Because without imagination, sociology simply dies. It's dull. It's boring. We have to cultivate, think hard about this imaginative quality. And then the last thing, of course, is the fourth thing, is um, the policy applications, Indeed, um, yeah. that we're not just um, doing this for fun or for, for the sake of it. I mean, it, they're important issues which we think and write about, but to um, they have a purchase on how we deal with really important issues in our society, how we manage religious diversity. Um, what would you say to um, either local or, or, or central government um individuals who are responsible for for important decisions, Um, how would you advise them? Have you got the, not only the knowledge, but but also the capacity to get your point across? Um, We often talk in our society about people being religiously illiterate. It's, that is so, and that's an important issue, which you might be addressing later on in your series. But we also need to address the fact that sociologists and sociologists of religion need to be politically literate or policy literate in order to convey their ideas to to decision makers. Yeah, that's an interesting theme, this this idea of uh, a social function, a legal function, which is something we'll be coming back to, I think, in the last episode um, in discussing the sort of difference of function between sociology, religion and other uh, ways of approaching religion. But it's, it's, it's interesting to flag that up right now. Um, maybe we should move back to like, the history of these things. What strikes me about the history of the sociology of religion is that many of the foundational figures of the sociological approaches are actually really the founders of any kind of study of religion. You know, some of the real foundational, kind of the first people ever to look at religions in any kind of academic sense. Um, I, I think we need a cut-off point. Um, we can't go right back to the very, very beginning, or we'll be here forever. But <laughs> say we start in the beginnings of um, sociology as a discipline. I, I mean, yeah. you, c- you can just put a marker on that by saying 
uh, one reason why sociology emerged at this moment, the moment of industrialization, urbanization of European societies, was that the traditional patterns that we were familiar with, um, pre-modern society, rurally based society largely, um, were being dislocated very profoundly by the Industrial Revolution and the urbanization that went with it. And so a whole group of people began to emerge in the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century, trying to understand what was happening, why it was happening. And um, these are what we often call our founding fathers. I'm afraid it's gendered, but they were men. <laughs> um, uh, Marx, Karl Marx, Max Weber, Emil Durkheim and Georg Simmel. And, and we are... Um, it's interesting to note that all four of them took notice, took note of religion, recognized its significance, but in very, very different ways. So shall we go um, through them really quickly? Yeah, if, if we could do it really quickly, that would be um, brilliant. I'll yeah. do my best. Well, think of <laughs> Marx. He is concerned um, about religion as an ideology. And um, this famous phrase of his of false consciousness that religion was in some way blinding um, working people from the exploitations of labor um, and preventing them seeing clearly um, that they were being exploited and that they needed to find um, an, a, a, a way out of this dilemma. Um, and religion was seen, as it were, as a kind of cloak, as a, as a disguise, something that prevented people seeing clearly. It's profoundly negative. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the, for Marx, the, the, the really important dimension of society, the real motor of society, were economic relations. And religion was seen as a superstructure, as a reflection of that. Max Weber, of course, is very, very different. And, and, and I mean, he wrote about so many things. It's, I can't really do that quickly, but I'm going to pick on one, which is his recognition that religion could be a very, very powerful motivator. Yeah. Um, I mean, you think of his work on the Protestant ethic, which is complex, and you need to think through the detail uh, uh, and the nuance in that argument. But at its core is the notion that seriously held belief has consequences. Uh, and I think that's something that we need to hold on to today, um, that, that um, even if the, <clears throat> the core of sociology is not about truth or truth claim, we need to take very seriously the content of belief um, in order that we can see what motivates people. Mm. Give a modern example. What motivates people to migrate? Um, all sorts of reasons. Primarily, the, 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 um, the motivation is, is economic. Um, they're looking for a better life. But quite often, religion is, is a very powerful factor in enabling that to happen contacts, um, the feeling of, of being led or called or that kind of thing. And um, there's a whole series of questions we could ask in that respect. So think of that in terms of Weber. Durkheim, who is the exact contemporary of Weber, um, was concerned about social order and cohesion. Mm-hmm. And um, he could see in post-World War I France that um, the Catholic Church was in a way, not able to fulfill this um, traditional function that society was changing to the extent that, that this was no longer, as it were, a tenable situation. And he was asking questions about, well, if that doesn't work, what is going to bind society? How are we going to hold the thing together? And for goodness sake, that is a question that still resonates um, powerfully in modern Britain. You know, we talk an enormous amount about social cohesion. And you hear an echo of Durkheim in that. And finally, Zimmel, less prominent in many accounts, but with the really interesting perception that content and form are different, that um, religion in terms of content precedes its formal structures in terms of, if you like, world faiths, Um, that there's a disjunction between um, religiousness or religiosity and religion, formal religions. Um, and I guess that's the kind of thing that lies behind my ideas about believing without belonging. Yeah. It seems to me that the, these uh, scholars in their different ways are all, the way that they engage with the structure of society is intimately kind of connected to this idea of social change. It's, it, it happens at this moment of great um, 
you know, industrialization, um, urbanization, uh, people are moving, society is changing quite profoundly, and the interest in religion seems to come from an awareness of the changing role of, of um, the shifting of power, perhaps, away from churches and into um, what we would now call sort of democratic. Um, and I think, is that why the idea of modernity and modernization is such a um, continuing central theme of the sociology of religion right up to the present day? It certainly is. Uh, I mean, this, if you like, was how um, these thinkers, uh, the people like Marx and, and, and Weber and, and Durkheim, the people we've just talked about, they were thinking about what what is modernity, what makes societies modern. And, and they, of course, thought that industrial society was probably the end of the line, if you like. This, this was modern in their conception. Whereas now we are beginning to realise that, the, 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 well, we had a whole phase of talking about the postmodern, but we can at least see that um, industrial society uh, and, and the forms of power uh, uh, and the structures that went with it, uh, I mean, the forms of economic and, uh, uh, and technological power um, and all the kinds of forms of society that went with it um, are not the end of the line because we, we, we subsequently have had the whole IT revolution and that's bringing together, um, or making us think about a completely different set of patterns of society and the way people relate to each other. Uh, and, and religion is going to, to change again. Um, I mean, there's a lot of work done. I don't know whether you're going to pick it up in some of your, 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 your th- this series, which would be excellent, is, you know, religion on the web and, 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 and how people network and that they gather less. And, and, and you see political parties and trades unions changing really very um, markedly because, if you like, our Conservative and Labour Party resonated very strongly with a particular division of Labour which was associated with um, industrial society, um, yeah. which is clearly not working now. That's one reason why mm. why our traditional parties are, 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 are all in a mess, because it just doesn't work anymore. And we've got to think of new political structures, new economic structures and new ways of being religious now, religious organisations are in difficulty in this situation because um, they have to work out which of these changes they, as it were, accept or reject. Um, and that's true to an extent organisationally. It's even more true in terms of uh, the changing habits of society. That's taking me in a slightly different direction, but, but maybe it's worth just following that for a moment. I mean, the huge debates about gender and about same sex are great examples. Um, to what extent do religious organizations follow the trends of society and to what extent do they resist them? And the that questions comes is how do religious organizations make decisions? Um, they don't find it very easy sometimes and they do it in very different ways. Uh, is it congregationally based? Is it top down? Is it, um, you know, is it do we all do the same how far can a big um, global church discipline all the bits of it? Um, all these things are, as it were, ongoing, change is continuous, and modernity itself evolves. Um, and, and so our work is never done. Uh, we've got Our agenda is continuing, and it is important to say, um, absolutely crucial to say, that there is no necessarily antipathy between being modern and being religious. No, absolutely not. No, in fact... That's one of the very interesting things um, about the last, say, 30 years of, um, of sociological study into religion. I mean, uh, the organization thesis was such an essential part of sociology for a long time. And for any of our listeners that don't know, that's just the idea that in some form or another, um, religion is necessarily dying out or at least um, retreating in the modern world. And um, you can go and listen to our interview with Linda Woodhead on the subject um, for further details, but we've seen quite clearly that this isn't really the case. And I mean, there's we could go into a lot of different explanations for you know what is happening, but it's quite clear that, for instance, the U.S. well, at least until very recently, is not getting significantly less religion. They're uh, less religious. They're um, more or less absolutely as Christian as they ever were, um, and so. The sort of country which is the, um, the paragon of modernity, at least the, certainly it's, it's the way it sees itself, um, remains devoutly religious. 
You've got it quite right. Um, I think the US is changing now. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that develops. Hmm. Um, but you, for example, we're anticipating we're in the middle of a, a presidential election in the US. Uh, and it's absolutely clear that if Donald Trump um, does not get the conservative religious vote, um, his chances of a successful election are, um, I, I mean, he just can't do it. I mean, that vote is absolutely essential, essential to the Republican candidate. Um, now, we all hope and pray that, that the conservative religious vote might might be a little bit more discerning, but we'll we'll leave that on one side for the moment. <laughs> but but it, 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 the point is, it cannot be ignored. Never mind the rights and wrongs of the decision; it simply cannot be ignored in an American uh, election. Um, now, Europe is a little bit different. Uh, this is where we need to, uh, to, to do a bit of joined up thinking of what we've been saying so far. It's the case that sociology and thus sociology of religion emerge out of the European case, the European um, Industrial Revolution and all the things that went with it. Um, but as we increasingly look at the modern world and the place of religion in it, we see that Europe is probably not the pattern, the global prototype, not the, not the way that it's going to be everywhere else. It is an exceptional case. You very kindly mentioned my own book with that title at the beginning. Um, and, and, and that means that we're going to have to be a bit cautious about taking European theory and simply applying it everywhere else. Um, and this is where I think you have to recognize as well that sociological theory and thinking about the sociology of religion is not simply one theory, one size fits all. We have to recognize that um, theory is contextual, that it it emerges in particular paces to as it were, resolve specific rather than general problems. And for this reason, of course, and you mentioned the American case, um, Americans have a very different body of theory, uh, which they call rational choice theory, and it works on a completely different way from from the predominant thinking about secularization, which comes from Europe. Mm. Uh, um, if you look at the book I wrote on the sociology of religion, you'll find the different kinds of theory in different parts of the world set out um, recognizing this crucial point that theory emerges to resolve problems and we have different problems in different parts of the world. Absolutely, which is why always keeping our theoretical models at the front of our minds when we're um, writing or talking or thinking about religion is, is essential because it reminds us that our theories and our ways of thinking are contextual historically and geographically. Yeah. And, you know, often we'll repeat our own assumptions um, and apply them universally, but you know this leads to mistakes. I mean, think about the way that we created religion um, in our own image when you know in the colonial project, for instance. Um, so yes, it's important to remember the new generation in sociology. By the time they get to retirement, like I am, they will be dealing with issues that I probably can't imagine now. Um, I'm pretty convinced that they will be engaging with religion, um, but maybe in different ways and different forms. Um, and there may well be more people who, who f have chosen, certainly in the West, in the developed world, to live outside um, any kind of form of religion or, or have no religious belief. Um, that's part of the story. But we must not assume that everybody is going to do what the West does now. Um, mm -hmm. The West is very um, tempted by that um, narrative. And it's a dangerous one. Yes, indeed. And um, we see the growing power of I mean, the BRICS nations, for instance. I, I suspect, and not only in terms of, of study of religion, but also you know, economic power and world power, it's not going to be the, the same um, end of empire kind of situation that the sociology of religion was born into. And things may be very different. We may be being uh, told what models to use by, um, by other powers, perhaps, in a few years to come. Um, but to return to the UK for a, for a, a little bit, UK's really been um, quite an important site for uh, the sociology of religion, um, going right back to uh, St. Ninian Smart and the founding of Lancaster and things like that, um, leading up to the foundation of, of Socrail uh, 40 years ago. Um, could you uh, tell us a little bit about that sort of British 
um, institutional history of it? Um, I, I'm quite curious that you mentioned Lancaster and Ninian Smart because I would say Ninian Smart is quintessentially um, a scholar of religious studies, and I don't think that's quite the same as the sociology of religion. Yeah, um, I, I would I tend to agree, but um, certainly by maybe after Smart's time, but more recently Lancaster has been a real uh, the strongest center of the sociology of religion in the UK. I would think. Um, would you not agree? What I think is really very interesting about that is that um, the beginnings, how you situate the sociology of religion in, um, in as it were, the world of scholarship, do you locate it in departments of sociology or do you locate it in um, departments of religious studies um, or, or theology religious studies? And I think one of the most interesting changes I've observed in, in, in my working life is a swing away from sociology towards religious studies. I mean, if I were to go back when I was a graduate student in the 60s, now paradoxically, um, the LSE had the largest number of people working in the sociology of religion. Um, and, and if you think of uh, Jim Beckford's work or, or, or um, sort of my place in Exeter, as we and the people in the LSE all retired, none of us were replaced in as scholars of religion, as sociologists of religion. Each of those departments in the LSE in Warwick and Exeter went um, in a different direction. Um, that's fine. That's up to them. But it, it's, it's, I think, indicative of, of how sociology in the mainstream um, has been reluctant to take religion seriously. And that, to me, is... is um, um, a, a negative rather than a positive statement, put it that way. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the um, field of religious studies or theology of religious studies, those departments have broadened out from being departments of theology and, and they, uh, uh, very many of them now, I mean, uh, I, I, in addition to Lancaster, I would certainly mention Durham um, yeah. or Leeds, and they have really important groupings of people um, working in on the social science scientific approaches to religion alongside um, theology, in the case of Durham or Leeds, um, but you see a relocation of the subdiscipline, and, and that's absolutely fine as far as I'm concerned. But I think it has a very negative effect on sociology, which is not maintaining its links with the sociology of religion. It's mm. shifting more to anthropology. I mean, there's a good case in the in the LSE, which now has a lot of activity surrounding religion, but based in, 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 in the Department of Anthropology, not Sociology. Um, whereas now let's take the Nordic case. Um, in the Nordic case, Sociology of Religion has been in faculties of Lutheran faculties of theology almost since the beginning. Only very recently has social science begun to, to engage these important questions. In France, you have no faculties of theology at all. They're proscribed by law in public universities. And so um, sociology of religion has developed rather differently in the French case, reflecting French preoccupations, um, different again in the US. Um, so you would have to work out sort of where your scholars of religion are located, for what reasons. And within that context, you're absolutely right that places like Lancaster and Durham, I, w I would emphasize the work in Durham. I think it's it's it, it's very important. Um, Leeds, and then there are new centres growing in new universities like at Roehampton in London. Different clusters of younger people. I think that's very interesting too. Um, and within this, Socrel has been a brilliant organisation, and there's a wonderful paradox there. Um, it's the second largest subgroup in the British Sociological Association. Very active, continuing active for 40 years, um, nurturing new generations of scholars. I, I have huge gratitude to that group for what it did for me at a crucial point in my career. Um, bringing on the, you know, the PhDs, the postdocs, the young sort of um, new career scholars. I think it's done a brilliant job and still does. And it's a hugely important site. And uh, lots of the Nordic people come um, to the conference, there are really good links between that group and the Nordic group, which itself is growing. 
um, and its equivalents in the US. So a really important group and a great, um, as it were, encouragement, both personal as well as professional, to younger scholars. Indeed, uh, you know, uh, helping us to produce this series as well, which is um, going to uh, introduce uh, Sockrell to um, perhaps American audience, certainly, and to um, strengthen the links, actually, between Sockrell and the BASR and other and more RS groups rather than sociology of religion groups, which is, you know, this is a great benefit, I think. Um, we've uh, we've been talking a while. It's, it's fascinating. We could go on talking for quite a bit. <laughs> I mean, no, I haven't even got halfway through my, my list of points, but um, maybe just briefly to end, uh, you could just offer a quick reflection on, on where you think uh, sociology of religion is, is moving in the future. Um, and hopefully this will set up uh, the, the interviews um, in the weeks to come? Um, I think there's a very bright future for, future for the sociology of religion. Um, I, I would be cautious, I think, in, in, in saying in which direction it's going to go, to, going to go because there's so many possibilities. Um, clearly, one really important place is um, how European societies particularly manage both a trend towards secularization and growing religious diversity. Um, I think it has a hugely important function um, in terms of, of p- political or social life of this country in helping increasing numbers of people to debate constructively or speak well about religion. And that's Adam Dinham's work on religious literacy. And I think that is hugely important. I also hope that, that in taking paying attention to minorities, which is really important, that we don't lose sight of the mainstream. There's a huge amount of work still to be done. One thing that um, I didn't mention earlier when we were talking about new technologies is, of course, that precisely those technologies and, and, and really powerful statistical tools means that the quantitative work can take, as it were, huge steps forward. Think of David Vos's work. He's now at UCL um, and how, you, you know, um, Simply the potential to produce these big global databases, da- databases, and, uh, and um, um, how we're going to think about those, and, and, and the, simply the power at our disposal in terms of quantitative work is 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 exciting and very challenging. And um, that's not for me, but fortunately we have increasing numbers of scholars who are um, trained to, to deal with those issues and to think carefully in that way. Um, the interface with politics is hugely important. Uh, we need, um, in some ways, better connections with the historians. When we think of the work about the 50s and 60s. Um, is that sociology or is that history? Um, uh, uh, and I think, you know, for, for me, it's almost history. I don't, well, I, 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 when people talk about the 60s, I tend not to think of it as history. I think, well, that just happened. <laughs> um, but somebody of a younger generation will think, well, that is history. And we're beginning to, to as it were, rethink those crucial early post-war decades. Uh, and, and when are the big, when are the hinge decades in, in the story of religion in this country? Is it the 60s? Is it the 1980s? Is it the millennium? The, 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 there are so many ways of thinking about this. Um, never mind, never mind, David, the global situation. What is happening in China and the Pacific Rim? What about the subcontinent, Southeast Asia? Um, what about sub-Saharan Africa? What about the tragedy in the Middle East? Um, these call for clear thinking about the place of religion and its connections with politics in, in, in the modern global order. And the challenges are huge. That's a perfect place to stop. That's a real uh, call to action and a reminder of the importance of, of what we do as uh, scholars. So I'll say um, once again, thank you for being on the Religious Studies Project, Grace Davy. My pleasure. It was wonderful to hear you speaking to Grace there. Um, wonderful that the technology worked out as and, well. And, I mean, let's not be coy. It was wonderful to hear Grace talking <laughs> yeah. there. So, yeah. Sorry, David. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I hear you all the time. <laughs> as to our listeners. Um, so that was that was a great introduction and great to hear about just the the. the different approaches that are used in different contexts and the way in which our sort of theory produces data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was the first in this uh, Sockrell series. So we've got another few coming out that we're going to 
pepper throughout this uh, semester before Christmas. Um, I've been speaking to Don Llewellyn. Um, he's a, a, a great friend of the RSP, uh, of the University of Chester. So we speak about religion and feminism. I also spoke to Naomi Thompson about religion, youth, and intergenerationality, and that was they, they were both recorded at this year's Sockrell Conference at Lancaster University back in July. And we also have an interview with Anna Stran coming up, which was recorded in Helsinki at the EASR by Katie Aston. And um, Katie is actually joining the Religious Studies Project team. Um, the loyal followers of the RSP um, will know Katie from a few of the response pieces that she's written for us. Um, and I know Katie very well through um, work over at the Non-Religion and Secularity Research Network. And she is going to be um, taking over our features editing. Um, so as you as you all know, we've had Kevin Whitesides in that position for a few years now. We've been doing a fantastic job. And Kevin's still going to be staying around in the RSP team. We're not losing Kevin, um, but we're really excited to be welcoming another person to the team and to be getting sort of her seeing Katie make the the role her own indeed um K Kevin recently had a little girl and his PhD work is hotting up so we really needed to just take something off his plate um for a little while but we'll be it won't be the last we hear of Kevin let's put it that way well he is our round table regular <laughs> well indeed and uh we'll we'll hold him to that one of these days um Absolutely. as for the rest of the team we still have Yana doing your ops digest every week you still have uh Thomas J. Coleman III as our general editor. And if you send an email to the RSP, it's it's Tommy that you're going to get hold of. And excitingly, uh, by the time this goes out, Tommy might actually have arrived in the UK to start his uh, PhD. So we're looking forward to spending yeah. some time hanging out with him. And I think there's a high chance that he will be appearing in next year's Christmas special. That would be absolutely fantastic. Um, yes, he's um, starting at Coventry University, um, so we're delighted to have him here. Although, you know, sad to be losing our uh, Tennessee correspondent. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so if there's an... <laughs> Tommy, if you know someone else out there in Chattanooga who can just sort of, you know, call in and every so often and tell us how things are, that would be wonderful. I think we've pretty much covered our news for now um, for now i mean i'm sure there's plenty of things we're going to um, come up with um, over the weeks uh, there's certainly a few things that we haven't announced yet but hopefully we'll be yeah. able to do so soon um next week um it's another interview that david recorded um this was at the easr conference he's going to be speaking with uh, i'm totally going to get this wrong milda alaskowskiana Perfect. On communism and Catholicism, religion and religious studies in Lithuania. Yeah. So really interesting. Um, I've had a few conversations recently with people um, about the different ways, the institutional ways in which we study religion. The post-communist countries are a particularly interesting case because, of course, it was completely outlawed under um, communism. And yet, in most of these countries, there was a strong Catholic context beforehand. And so we talk a little bit about the religious situation itself, how it has or hasn't rebounded and any changes that there's been um, in these post-communist countries, particularly Lithuania, of course, um, but also about how they've now gone about rebuilding the academic study of religion in Lithuania um, and the particular challenges and in institutional contextualization um, that that situation produces. Wonderful. Well, really look forward to hearing that, David. So thanks to our sponsors, the BASR, to Nasser, to the Australian Association for um, sponsoring our email list. If you aren't already subscribed to that, go onto our homepage. You can subscribe and get these in whatever sort of daily digest, weekly digest, monthly digest, whatever you want, you can do. And don't forget about our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google+, iTunes, iTunes. We're pretty much everywhere. Find us, like us, rate us, spread the word. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.